Okay, great. Heart Sutra. That's good. Uh, we do the Heart Sutra in order to clear away any misconceptions, in order to reacquaint ourselves with um, the whole path to enlightenment. And um, so, let's see, would you like to read? Ante la triple joya aria, así oí una vez. El Bhagavan estaba en la montaña llamada Pico de Buti, en Rasmiza, acompañado de una gran asamblea de monjes y de budistas. En aquella ocasión, el Bhagavan estaba bajo la concentración sobre las calabrías de un fenómeno llamada Perfección de Hombre. Al mismo tiempo, también el área de Avalustaba y de Isada Mahasatva consideraba la práctica de la profunda perfección de la sabiduría y percibía los cinco agregados también vacíos de existencia. Entonces, por el poder de duda, el general de Shariputra preguntó a Daria a Mahasatva, ¿cómo debería adiestrarse un hijo de buen linaje que desea practicar la profunda perfección de la sabiduría? Así dijo el área de la Mahasatva y el Mahasatva, respondió al general Shariputra con estas palabras. Shariputra, cualquier hijo o hija de buen linaje que desea practicar la profunda perfección de la sabiduría deberá contemplarla así, considerando repetidamente de modo correcto estos cinco agregados como también partidos de naturaleza inherente. La forma es particular, la vacuidad es forma, la vacuidad es más que forma, la forma no es más que vacuidad. Del mismo modo, la sensación, la discriminación, los factores de composición de la conciencia son vacíos. Shariputra, así mismo todos los fenómenos son vacíos, sin características, no son producidos ni destruidos, no son impuros ni libres de ingredientes, ni deficientes ni completos. Por eso, Shariputra, y la vacuidad no hay forma, ni sensación, ni discriminación, ni factores de composición, ni conciencia. No hay ojo, ni oído, ni nariz, ni lengua, ni cuerpo, ni mente. No hay forma visible, ni sonido, ni olor, ni sabor, ni objeto de tacto, ni fenómeno. No hay elemento del ojo, y así hasta no haber elemento de la mente, ni elemento de la conciencia mental. No hay ignorancia, ni extinción de la ignorancia, hasta no haber envejecimiento, ni muerte, ni extinción del envejecimiento y de la muerte. Así sí mismo no hay sufrimiento, ni origen, ni cesación, ni camino. No hay sabiduría suprema, ni logro, ni tampoco ausencia de logro. Así pues, Ariputra, como no hay logro, los bodhisattvas confían en la perfección de la sabiduría. La mente sin oscurecimiento ni miedo, ni moran en ella. Así trascienden los errores y alcanzan la meta del nirvana. También todos los budas de los tres tiempos, de modo manifiesto y completo, despiertan a la insuperable, perfecta y completa iluminación basándose en la perfección de la sabiduría. Por eso, el mantra de la perfección de la sabiduría, el mantra del gran conocimiento, el mantra insuperable, el mantra igual a inigualable, el mantra que pacifica por completo todo su sufrimiento, debe ser reconocido como la verdad porque no es falso. Este es el mantra de la perfección de la sabiduría. Shariputra, así de ahora en la profunda perfección de la sabiduría, el bodhisattva amasado. En ese momento, el Bhagavan emergió de la concentración y a la nueva de la vida lo contestó a la vida. Y se lo con estas palabras. Bien dicho, bien dicho, bien dicho, bien dicho, bien dicho. Así es, así es, la profunda perfección de la sabiduría debe ser practicada exactamente tal como has indicado, e incluso los tapagatas se arreglan. Después de que el Bhagavad no dijo eso, el venerable Sharapatiputra, el área de la que se para, el uso de Sara Mahasattva, de toda la sabiduría, junto con el tomatumio de los dioses humanos, asuras y grandarmas, se llenaron de júbilo y alabaron las palabras del Bhagavad. Y luego, refugio en Gorichita. Refugio en Gorichita. Sangay, <laughs> 
And if it helps, you can frame these ideas into your own words and imagine them really connecting with your heart. So we're going to study the 12 links of dependent arising in order to break the wheel. And in uh, looking at the 12 links of dependent arising, we should really be again and again looking at this is our own everyday experience within one moment, within one day, within one lifetime, over many lifetimes. This is really the way habit patterns progress. And most of our habit patterns lead to suffering, and so we want to first just identify what the problem is, and then we can find where are the areas where we can really break the pattern. Um, and so this is really an examination of your own experience. And so keep coming back to how does this apply to me? How does this apply to my own mental habits? Uh, how does this look like in the world? And then how might this function in future lives? How might I be experiencing this as a result of past lives? So this is you, this wheel of life. Um, it's very easy to say samsara or cyclic existence are something outside of yourself. Like you're going out into samsara when you go to the grocery store. But really samsara is you. And that also means that you have the power to break it. So we're going to start by kind of making friends with this image. So if you all have a um, little image of the Wheel of Life in front of you, or this one that's up here on the board, um, what I'm going to do is just introduce you to all of the pictures and what they represent, and then we're going to go deeply into each one. So just in the beginning, we're going to make friends with the image. Some of the pictures are quite obvious and straightforward what they might represent, and some of them might make no sense at all. So um, this is a really important image in Buddhism, um, in Tibetan Buddhism specifically, but it's actually said that the Buddha himself inspired this image during his lifetime. So this is one of the oldest teaching tools within Buddhism that we have. Um, it's an ancient set of images um, that the Buddha himself inspired his um, disciples to go ahead and draw. You'll find this at the doorway or at the back of many monasteries, in, um, especially in India, which is basically to say the whole point of entering the Gampa is to break yourself free of this. Um, sometimes there's even a monk or a nun whose main job is to explain this picture. Yeah, to like tourists or people visiting. So this is a really important image to get to know. Alright, so we're going to start at the top. And uh, do you see there's a man with a stick? Yeah. So this man with a stick um, represents a blind person, which represents ignorance, the beginning of the problem. And of course, um, immediately, um, if you have friends in your life who are blind, you're offended on their behalf, and you say, that's not kind to associate blind people with ignorance, how rude. Um, <laughs> and so just go ahead and acknowledge that, it is rude. Um, but we understand the point that's being made, is that ignorance obscures us to reality in some way. Yeah, Ignorance is a, a type of blindness to the way things are, which should really sound very different to other presentations and maybe other religions of something like original sin. It's not original badness that we have, it's an innate confusion about the way we exist and the way our world exists. So we need to really um, think about this type of ignorance very clearly. It's, it's almost like an innocence, this type of ignorance, all right? So you're not bad for having it. It's just an innate confusion that every single sentient being has. And it is together with the mind, but it can be removed from the mind. Yeah, it's additional to it. It's not 
the nature of the mind to be ignorant. It's just been ignorant so far. We can train ourselves out of it. Okay, so the first one is ignorance. Then we have um, a guy making pots, and they're pots of various sizes. And this is uh, representing karmic formations, or just karma, simply put. <clears throat> and basically, from the ignorance, we do actions. And the pots are of various sizes because our karmic weight is of different weights. Yeah? So some actions are really um, very karmically heavy and will bring about a really large result. Some of our actions are relatively small and will bring a relatively small result. A lot of that depends on the motivation. A lot of that depends on how much kind of thought and time you put into the action and whether or not you actually completed it. So if you do something in a distracted, careless way, it has a lot um, less karmic weight than if you sit down and decide to do something, proceed to do it, and finish it. Makes sense, logically. A little bit like the law, right? Um, but this is both for good things and for bad things. Yeah? So this is karmic formation. Then we have uh, consciousness, which is represented by a monkey. And um, that should make you a little bit reassured that the consciousness has been like a monkey from the time of the Buddha and even before that. It's not like new that it's this easily distracted. Um, if you've been to a country like India where you see monkeys everywhere, they are so distracted and they're so chaotic. And they're eating this and then they're fighting with that and then they're having sex with this and they're running around and they're just... They're nutty, yeah? Um, especially in Dharamsala if you're eating lunch. But um, we think about this monkey as not a bad creature, do we? We just think of it as a chaotic creature, yeah? That's just really all over the place. And this is the way our mind is. It's not bad, it's just chaotic. And through mental transformation, we can bring it into some control. We can train it into happiness. But at first, it's useful to just acknowledge the monkey nature of consciousness and realize, yeah, that is kind of how it is. If I even sit for one minute watching my own thoughts, they can go from profound to mundane to sacred to profane, just all in one minute. They can blank out into some sort of sleepy haze, they can go into inspired ideas, but the mind is just always moving around. So this is why it's like a monkey. Okay. Then we have name and form, which was represented by people um, in a boat. And this one is um, maybe not as intuitive to understand. The first three you might kind of understand pretty quickly. Name and form is referring to the five aggregates. Five aggregates. Um, does anyone remember the five aggregates, what they are? Form. Form, very good. Yeah, form. This we know. Sensations. Sensations. Yeah, feeling. Yeah. Perceptions. Perceptions. Yeah, recognition. Yeah. Com uh, I don't know in English. Uh, factors de composición, yeah, compound factors, yeah. factors, and consciousness. And consciousness. consciousness. Yeah, nice one. Yep. Yeah. So we have form, feeling, feeling. Yep. Uh, recognition, discrimination. Yes, depending how you put it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, we have compositional factors and primary consciousness. So compositional factors, um, we should understand to be all the rest of the mental factors, like put in a big bag. Yeah. The main one being intention. Yeah. So basically what we're saying is from consciousness, then you move or evolve, for lack of a better word, into having these five main like piles or groups of your experience as an individual. And that's why it's kind of like people in a ship, you know? You're, like the ship is you, or the body, yeah, not really you. And together with it are different passengers navigating in different ways. But, you know, it's all kind of several different things you could isolate separately, but part of one full experience as well. So the five aggregates are something we really want to explore in a bit more depth as the course goes by. But if you want to think about what is samsara technically, Samsara technically is the five aggregates, yeah? But the five aggregates that are 
bound by karma and disturbing emotions? Yeah. Okay. So then we have a house, an empty house, which represents the six forces. Yeah, or the six um, kind of windows or rooms for the senses to enter into, like eye, ear, nose, tongue, etc. Those that we're used to hearing about from childhood, plus the mental. And then we move into some people making love, which represents contact. Okay, and so this imagery is used, it's a bit graphic, right? You're going into a monastery and then there's people having sex in the front door and you think, goodness, what is heavens, right? That's unexpected. But it's um, graphic on purpose because it's, it's representing the meaning, the meeting of the outside with the inside. Yeah? When the outside meets the inside, you have contact. And as soon as there is contact, there is a feeling about it. Does that make sense? The feeling is represented by an arrow in the eye. Also graphic, right? Like, God, Buddha's so sexy and violent. What's going on? This should have a, a rating, yeah? Children shouldn't be allowed to see this. But um, really, you're showing the graphic nature of our experience is that you come into contact, and then you have a feeling about it. And you cannot ignore either one of those experiences. They're powerful, big experiences. And feeling being like an arrow in the eye, doesn't mean that it's always unpleasant. It just means you can't ignore it. There's a lot of things going on with our mental experience, but the one that's very difficult to ignore is feeling. You're either feeling pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Generally happy, generally unhappy, or neutral. And that's a really big part of your experience, even though there's a lot of other things going on. You're saying different things to yourself, you're remembering things, you're planning things, all sorts of stuff's going on in your mind. But a huge part of your experience is feeling. And feeling is a place where we want to do a lot of our work in Dharma work. Yeah, because our natural association with feeling is to believe that it's wisdom. Feeling is not wisdom. Yeah, feeling is just response. It's important information but we're really used to giving it too much power. Feeling is the ripening result of the past, coming into contact with the present moment conditions. And yet we think that what we're feeling now is 100% about right now. And so then we make decisions about right now based on a conditioned experience from the past, which means that it's a little bit flawed. Yeah, and you see this with children all the time, right? That they're um, really reacting to their feelings in quite an abrupt way. If they're a little bit too hot, then they start crying. Or they're a little bit too cold, they, they're really upset or they get kind of, um, I don't know, sleepy or confused. You know, they're really reacting to their feeling experience in the body. And they're also really reacting to their feeling experience in the mind. If they're a little unsettled, for example. And it's really easy to then blame the circumstance. You know, when little kids are very tired, you could say something very simple to them, like, put your, clo put your clothes away, and then they burst into tears. Yeah, and they think it's because you told them to put away their clothes that they're so sad. When in fact, they're tired, meeting with the condition of being told something, overwhelmed and fall apart, right? And we're still like that, it's just we're more subtle about it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, contact and feeling are a really interesting things to start exploring because what we come into contact with directly has an influence on how we're feeling and so much of that is conditioned that it's useful to ask yourself, should I come into contact with all of the things that are in my life right now? Or is it better to separate myself from some of them while I build a new mental habit? Even though it's not the fault of those things I come into contact with, how I feel, still there is strong condition because of my past conditioning. Yeah, so it could be that some people can watch a very violent show on television, but they don't have any kind of associations or habits of violence particularly, and so they can watch it, be entertained, move on with their life. Some people would watch the same exact show, but because they have some habits of violence in their life, after the show, immediately get into an argument with their partner. 
So it's not the show's fault, is it? But the show is a condition in a different way for different people. So if you know that your um, disposition is to be triggered by certain images, it's better to separate from those images while you build a new mental habit. So this is the way we start looking at how do we use our understanding of contact in our daily life. And then with our experience of feeling, what we want to ask ourselves is, just because it's pleasant, does that mean I need more of what's happening in the present to feel that comfortable feeling? Or is it actually much more about my mental attitude? So what normally happens without examination is that once you feel something, you move into craving more of it. Either wanting more happiness or wanting to be separated from what you call suffering. And so feeling leads to craving so quickly that we take them to be the same thing often. I feel I want, as if it's one moment. When there's usually I feel, and then I want, or I want to be separated from. So this is where we get into why mindfulness meditation is really important. We need to really start understanding what is going on with our mind. Mindfulness meditation is very useful for developing single-pointed concentration, which is useful in all aspects of your life. But mindfulness in general is about knowing what you're saying to yourself and knowing the different components of your mental experience so that you can find out where you're lying. Because we actually are telling ourselves lies all throughout the day. I need more of this, I need less of that. This is too much, that is not enough. We're saying things like that to ourselves all the time and believing them without challenging. And every once in a while we have enough mental space to catch ourselves in a lie. And it's so satisfying because then you can almost feel the pattern fall apart in your hands. Yeah, where maybe you're walking down the street and then you see in a shop window some, uh, I don't know, what do people like? Shoes? I don't know what they like. I'm wearing Crocs, I'm the wrong one to ask. But um, you see some shoes that you really like, and these are the ones, these are the ones, they will change my life. And you're excited about the shoes. <clears throat> and you really think, I need those for my happiness. Craving is arising. You start making plans about what you're going to wear with them, right? That's what people do. And, <laughs> and then something distracts you, and you start going somewhere else. And then, some hours later, you come back to the same shop, planning to buy those shoes, and realize you don't need them anymore. Yeah, you broke the spell because you interrupted the craving cycle. And so then when you came back to the same object, you're like, actually, I don't need those. It's such a nice feeling, isn't it, when you caught yourself in the lie and you naturally kind of let go of your craving? It wasn't forced, right? It was just that you interrupted that whole momentum that the craving had gotten into. So that's a good thing to know about the way the mind works, is that when it's getting really hungry for something, it's probably the wrong time to pursue it. It might be that you still pursue it, but wait and do it from wisdom. Yeah, so you say to yourself, oh, I need those shoes. Okay, if I really need them, I'll buy them tomorrow. And then tomorrow, you're like, eh, I don't really need them. Yeah, it happens really naturally, your wisdom comes back. Or the next day you say, yeah, I do need those, those are good, all right, do I have the budget for it, do I have the time? And then you buy it from a place of wisdom, rather than just, I need, I need. Do you know what I mean? So, noticing the impact on, of feeling on our decision-making process is so important, but it means you need to get to know yourself really well. So then if you don't catch yourself before you fall into craving, it's very easy for craving to turn into grasping, which is just an escalated form. Not only do I want and need that, I must have it, I must have it now. Or not only do I dislike this, but I dislike it so much it must go away immediately. So it increases its urgency, it increases its intensity. You know that feeling? And it can really get into um, not just your mind, but it can take over your body a little bit as well. Yeah? Um, it, it was really useful to look at this yesterday when it was so hot. Right? Um, <clears throat> I was trying to do without the air conditioning, because I was wanting to be a green person and save electricity. And, uh, and then it was getting so hot, and it was getting so hot, I thought. 
Okay, okay. No, no, I'm cool. I'm fine. It's a sauna. I like it. I like it. <laughs> I was trying to train myself, right? And it worked for a little while. And then I lost focus, and um, the suffering of my body was escalating into suffering of the mind. And then I really had to get up and just turn it on, and then, like, pour water over my head. But I, I realized that I had let it go too far, and an emotion had kind of taken over. Yeah, and an urgency. <clears throat> so this is a really good way for us to check, have I lost my wisdom? When there's that feeling of urgency, like I have to do it now, I have to do it now. That's usually not coming from wisdom. Yeah, attachment in particular gives an illusion of urgency. So at any time you're feeling like, I have to do it now, unless it's a dangerous situation, right? Like, I have to get out of the way of the car, right? But if you're feeling some urgency with a decision, this is usually a sign attachment has taken over. Is that true in your experience? That illusion of urgency? Yeah, that I must, I must, I must, I must. And then, you know, often then you make the choice, and then you go home, and you think, why did I do that? Or you, you know, buy too many things online. And you did need one or two of those things, but you didn't need all ten of those things. Yeah, and then you're, you know, checking out, click, 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 done, paid, and then you go, ah, oh, crap, actually, I only really needed that. I didn't need all of that. But because craving had kind of gotten ignited, then grasping got ignited, and then this feeling of, I have to, I have to. Yeah, so the mind lies to itself all the time. And there's a lot of just quick tricks to interrupt this pattern, as well as deep, kind of um, profound techniques to interrupt the whole tendency altogether. But if the first thing you can do is to just listen to what you're saying to yourself as you say it, but listen with a, a mind of wisdom that checks, is that actually true? If we listen in this way, we can start to get kind of... Um, I don't know, embarrassed or fragile or defensive if we do it in the wrong way. You want to remember that your afflictions and your negative mental habits all came from ignorance. You're not to be blamed for lying to yourself. Everyone lies to themselves. But if you're starting to become mindful, you can um, get a little bit like, oh my gosh, I'm such a mess, and feel bad about yourself, which is not at all the intention. You're trying to really hear, oh, this is unnecessary, what I've been doing all these years. And I learned it from my mother, or I learned it from my father, or from this situation, or this experience, or this aspect of my culture. And it all makes sense why I do it, but it actually doesn't function. Now I've caught myself, I'll stop. Yeah. Rather than making it a whole story about why you're bad, or making it a whole story about why society is bad, or your parents are bad. Just ask, is it functional? And if it's not, move through it and let it go. But it takes catching it in real time. Do you know that difference between when you're regretting something that happened a long time ago, as opposed to regretting something as it arises? It's got a really different impact on your mind. Yeah, you can think, oh, all those years ago, I wish I hadn't said this or that when I was angry. But if while you're angry, you can feel the world, words bubbling up and go, actually, this is not the right time to say this, then it falls apart right there in the moment and is much less likely to come back again. So it's hard to be mindful all the time because most of the time we're doing okay. It doesn't seem like worth the effort, does it? We can get away with not being mindful all the time because we're nice enough people. You know that feeling where it's like, yeah, I could be mindful, but also I could just kind of think about stuff and daydream and have music in my head and distract myself with my phone and, you know, it's not going to cause any harm because I'm a nice person. Yeah, because you are a nice person. But the problem is the afflictions are so ready to pop out that if you're not mindful, even in a relaxed, chill state of mind, if someone does something offensive to you, you just react with anger without any thought. Yeah, it just comes out. So to train yourself in mindfulness means you have to enjoy self-awareness, which means you have to have a really kind way of looking at your own mind. 
even a humorous way of looking at your own mind. You can even be amused by your own thoughts. Yeah, not the punishing attitude that's always trying to direct them and smack them into submission. Yeah, think this, not that. Don't do that. Right? It's not kind, but it's also not effective. It's not sustainable. You know, it's like um, exercising at the gym full force all day. You can't do it. You hurt yourself. But you can just be gently moving all throughout the day and keep your body relatively happy and your circulation flowing. So sometimes when we're just starting to learn mindfulness, it's like we are going to the mental gym and using the heaviest weights and we're doing it for a whole day and then the next day we're completely exhausted and don't do anything and we're just in bed like that. Right? Mentally. Right? So we want to treat mindfulness as this is a project that I need to be sustainable and all throughout the day. I don't want to be burning out and recovering. I want to just be gently waking myself up and even enjoying that process. The more I know myself, the more I understand humanity. The more I know myself, the easier compassion is. Yeah, you see yourself in everyone. Yeah? So just very slowly, slowly, but this is a really important piece, is to look at how craving and grasping really start to make our mind dysfunctional. Now, craving and grasping then <clears throat> condition the mind into what's called um, becoming or potential existence. And, okay, so um, potential existence. Um, and, you know, to, to go back, actually, the pictures, these two, <clears throat> just in case they're not obvious, um, uh, craving is like, it's sometimes someone drinking alcohol, and it looks like that's the um, picture that Nancy's like drawn say, here. Okay. Sometimes the people having sex are actually depicted over there. They move around this image. So this is kind of a classic image of the Wheel of Life. But um, occasionally they'll switch around which image they use to depict which link. So just know that that's a standard kind of picture, but occasionally things are moved around a little bit. The order, however, is not ever changed. So anyway, um, uh, craving is a person drinking alcohol, and grasping is your monkey again, but now he's going for fruit. He's not just playing, he's like, ah. yeah. Okay, so potential existence is a pregnant woman. Kind of looks like a guy dancing, but it's actually a pregnant woman. Okay. <laughs> Theoretically. And sometimes that one's also the couple having sex. I don't know, that one crops up all over the place, depending on uh, which artist you have. But in this case, it's a pregnant woman, which is a better image, actually. Because potential existence, yeah? You can kind of have that sense of, like, pregnant, something about to emerge, something about to go into. So this is really a place of a big transformation, and it's related to karma. So this is kind of the place of karma ripening. And then the next one is um, birth, which is depicted as a woman giving birth. But it's important to know that in Buddhism, birth is actually the moment of conception. Yeah, so when sperm and egg meet in terms of a human life, consciousness enters at that point. So that's birth from a Buddhist perspective, but it's depicted by physical birth in this picture. And then the last one is old age and death together. Um, and so it's an old man carrying a dead person on his back. Okay, so this is the cycle of life. And this cycle actually represents a minimum of two lives. And I'll explain this more during the weekend. But just to kind of get used to the pictures, okay? So these are the 12 links of dependent arising, these 12 that are around the outer edge. Yeah. Is there anything about the images um, that you wanted to clarify before we move into other pieces of the picture? I know it's a lot to take in all at once. Don't worry, we'll keep coming back to it. So these 12 are held um, by a monster, yeah, big scary monster, okay? So he is Yama, the Lord of Death, which is really impermanence, yeah, really impermanence. And his two arms that he's holding are karma and disturbing emotions. So this monster is not like an external figure, this is basically what is it that's keeping you trapped in this pattern, karma and disturbing emotions. 
and the fact that this whole process is impermanent is depicted by this monster. The impermanent part is actually good news if we frame it the right way. Okay, so um, he has three eyes, which are hard to see on this projection, but you can see in your picture. He has three eyes, which represent the past, present, and future. He has a, a crown of five skulls, which represent the five main negative states of mind. Those are attachment, anger, ignorance, jealousy, pride, in this particular grouping of lists. Okay, so he also has um, uh, four fangs, only two of them that you see, and those represent the four maras. So anyway, fun facts, we can go into some of those in more detail if we have time. But just so you know, what is the deal with this monster? It's not really some external figure, right? It's not some devilish creature. This is karma and disturbing emotions that keep the wheel together. Does that make sense? Um, up at the top is the Buddha pointing to the moon. <coughs> See there? Yes, he is. Oh, good. Just checking. So, um, the Buddha pointing to the moon um, represents that uh, basically liberation is possible. So the moon is like liberation, and the Buddha is saying, go there. <laughs> yeah. And um, <clears throat> some, some artists actually put the Buddha in each little segment of the six realms to kind of show that the Buddha is not just out there waiting, tapping his fingers, going, come on. Shake it off, stop having samsara, but it's actually in amongst all of the situations of suffering, trying to help beings get out of it in every context. Um, but anyway, that's why the Buddha is up the top, pointing at the moon, he's pointing to liberation. <clears throat> okay, so there's uh, some practices to do with yama that you can do if you're in the mood, which are very funny, which is that. Um, when you're going to the bathroom, you can think that um, afterwards you close the lid and you're closing the jaws of death. Yeah? Yama's jaws, like that. Um, and it's kind of a good way of um, resetting your mindfulness because we have to go to the bathroom anyway, right? We're, this is something that has to happen, we're human beings. And so if you're thinking everything that uh, came up until this point of being on the toilet, I'm just letting it go, and then I'm closing the jaws of death, and I'm hitting restart on my life, and starting fresh. It's kind of a nice way of thinking, yeah. And so you can bring Dharma to any chapter of your daily life, and uh, it's a good way to kind of revive your mindfulness. Um, anyway, this is a cute Lama Zopaism, so you can take it on if you'd like. <laughs> So the intersections, um, these are something that you can really look at in a lot of different ways. These are the six realms, or the six realms where sentient beings live within a samsaric environment. Now you can look at them in a kind of metaphoric way, or you can look at them in a literal way. You can look at them all within the human realm. Um, you can look at them in a lot of different ways, but they're a useful um, they're a useful tool to kind of look into because we can see how people make their environments through how they think. You know, when people are in a very contented, happy state of mind, they can be in somewhere that is very dirty and chaotic, and to them it appears really beautiful. You can see people who have all the riches and have all sorts of wealth that are just never satisfied. Um, so it's not really about the external environment, is it? It's about the mind you bring to it. Um, but we think that also karmically, we create the environment we experience. So this teaching on the six realms is quite an interesting one. So we start up the top, 12 o'clock. This is the God realm. So this is not like heaven, okay? This is more like um, heaven with negative states of mind. It's more like how maybe you would have heard the Greek gods and goddesses depicted back when you were in school, where um, things are lovely, people are lovely, everything is lovely, except people are kind of fighting and proud and, you know, full of it and causing all sorts of drama. 
Yeah, so it's a different kind of heavenly idea than maybe a Christian heavenly idea. It's a more close to the Greek. Um, and similar, right next to them are the demigods, who are very jealous of them. Because they have similar qualities, similar power, similar beauty, but not quite as good. And so they're um, really jealous of the gods. So the point that we want to derive from this for ourselves is there is a state of mind completely saturated by pride, and there's a state of mind completely saturated by jealousy, which makes it completely impossible to enjoy the beauty you have. We do this. Never mind the fairy story or the metaphor. Really think about how much we ruin our own beauty and our own abundance and all of the amazing things we have in our life because of either pride or jealousy. So in the case of pride, there's a fragility to pride. You have everything, you're satisfied with your wealth, or you're satisfied with your knowledge, or you're satisfied with your reputation, to a point, but you're always doing it in comparison to others. It's not kind of a pure satisfaction, it's a comparative satisfaction. So you're looking down on people. And when you're looking down on people thinking, oh, those poor things, they don't really understand. Oh, those poor things, they don't know how to manage their money. Those poor things, they don't know how to get fitness. When you're kind of looking down like this, you're actually in a very fragile ego. And you're kind of needing to sustain it and maintain it and worried about what other people think of it. Which means you don't enjoy all of this amazing stuff you're so proud of. You know, it's got an edge of fragility and there's a real need for maintenance. Yeah, and a real worry, what will people think? And then the other part of that is people who are always jealous. So it's similar to pride in the sense that there's always comparison. You might actually have a lot good going on in your life, but you're always looking at it in comparison to what isn't quite good enough or what other people have. And thinking even, they don't really deserve that. Yeah, or how come they get that? I'm a better person. Yeah, or, you know, this kind of thing that really steals your joy. Um, it can happen even just on a street, you know, with neighbors of similar houses. The person next door has a slightly better garden, or a slightly sweeter husband, or a slightly something. And just knowing that it's a little bit better than yours steals your enjoyment of yours. This is how jealousy really kills our joy. So it's interesting to kind of look at these two realms and ask ourselves, is there a mental tendency I have that is similar? Does that make sense? Yeah, so, yeah, so what do you think about these two, pride and jealousy? How they function in your life, how they dysfunction in your life? Do you ever feel sort of like you're having a lot of abundance, but then for some reason you can't enjoy it? Does this happen? Yeah. But her main worry is that she has inherited some material things, mm. and she's worried about how to make these things beneficial for other people. Mm. So she doesn't know where it fits them. Perhaps, she, for example, she has tried to, to give some money to for combination for mm -hmm. development, and the, the, the beneficiaries develop greed mm -hmm. to that, uh, uh, and, and even in the, they become violent if they don't get what mm -hmm. they want. So she doesn't know how to manage all this process of trying to be beneficial. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, related to the 12 links, it sounds like you're really uh, doing a good job at examining your own motivation and examining your own attachment and trying not to get caught by any greed yourself, which is really amazing. Mm -hmm. um, then the difficulty is then working with others and their afflictions, isn't it? And, and I think that you have to... I think you have to really be very careful to not kind of get swept up into um, the tendency of people to always want more by starting with very clear boundaries. 
um, to remember you know, how our own attachment functions can help us understand how other people's attachment functions. So you, know, you could take something as simple as like delicious cake and you have one little tiny piece of it because you've decided I can have one tiny piece. And then once you finish it, you see there's the rest of the cake there and you think, maybe I'll have a little more, a little more, a little more. Even though a little more, a little more makes you a little bit sick, still the mind of craving has kind of decided I need it, even though a little sliver was enough. This is the way that people you're giving money and charitable actions to are starting to think. That at first they were like, oh great, something I didn't expect, this extra support that's so great. And for a moment they're happy, and then they think, oh, what else could I get? Right? And so it's kind of like you have to be the grown-up and think of them as children. And say, look, I've offered this amount, this is the amount I've offered. I understand why you might want more, this is the amount I've offered. And you just kind of have to hold steady to your own with common sense. You know what's um, the amount that you're comfortable with. And it's much better to give an amount that you're really comfortable with because then when there's opportunities in the future, you'll happily give again. Whereas if you wind up giving way more than you're comfortable with, it's so easy to develop resentment or sadness or anger at the other side, even though it started out as a good project. So I know it's really difficult to um, ignore other people's afflictions, but if you start with this is, as, this is what I've decided to do for good, solid reasons. People are definitely going to react badly because people have greed, but I know I'm doing a good thing. You know, you have to really come back to your own wisdom and your own confidence. Trust yourself that you made a good choice, yeah? You really trust yourself. And then if later you think, actually, I could give a little more, then it's coming from your wisdom. It's not coming from a feeling of needing to make them feel better or needing to satisfy them. You're doing it because you want to, not because you've been crushed. Yeah. It's, it's difficult because we want people to like us, right? Yeah, so um, when we're being um, charitable in some way, we have to kind of be like a parent to children, where it's like, I'm doing this good thing for you, you may or may not appreciate it, you might actually want more, but as the parent I know this is the healthy amount, you can yell at me if you want to. Yeah, yeah it's hard, isn't it though? Yeah. yeah, but other thoughts? She says that in this society, this society is very competitive, so it's very difficult not to compare with other people because sometimes you need to be the best in something. Mm. So this is a reflection she, she wanted to share. Mm. <clears throat> and, and it's good to acknowledge that. Yeah. Um, and it's also good to ask yourself, what exactly do I want from life? What is my real motivation? And on my deathbed, what am I going to be really satisfied about and really happy to have done? And on my deathbed, what will I think was a waste of time? And, you know, and to also look back at false comparisons. For example, a lot of us think we would be happier if we were 10 kilos lighter and 10 years younger. <laughs> Except for you. <laughs> but, Actually, 10 years ago, 10 kilos ago, were we a happier person? Maybe. Maybe not, actually. We might have learned a lot in the last 10 years. We might have a deeper level of uh, contentment and wisdom. And yet we are somehow equating this sort of, uh, I don't know, youth and beauty as the recipe for our happiness. Even though we had youth and beauty at some point in our life, and we weren't necessarily happy because of it. So we have to kind of break false associations that society is saying, you know, be competitive about this, be competitive about that, because then you'll be happy. You won't. You weren't. Remember that. Yeah, and remember it on purpose again and again. Yeah, have you ever seen a photo of yourself as a little kid and thought, oh, I was cute. 
But when you were that little kid, you didn't think you were cute. Yeah, when you were a little kid, you thought, oh, I wish I was taller, I wish I was stronger, I wish I was cute, you know, whatever you thought when you were little. But now, you're like, oh, look. Yeah? So we have to remember that we've been telling ourselves lies for so long that when society tells us lies, we just assume they're right as well. And, you know, what does it take for someone to love us? To be loving, right? That's what it takes. But all of the rest is kind of miscellaneous extras. If we are a loving person, we will be loved by the right sort of people. And that, really, that's it. So really, that's the only ambition we're pursuing, right, is how to be a loving person. Because it's good for society, it's good for your heart, and it will wind up getting the thing that you want, which is love. Really, everything else is incidental. All other ambitions are kind of like... You know, we, part of us doesn't really acknowledge the lie that says, I'm doing this because I want to get love. <laughs> yeah, the job, the promotion, the beauty, the strength, the whatever, the whatever that we're ambitiously pursuing, at the core of it is, I just want to be loved. People love you already. Lots of people love you already. And those relationships can be even more rich and deep if you let go of all these extra activities trying to get love and just focused on your relationships and making them healthier. You know what I mean? So, you know, we lead by example then to not believe the lie. And then our friends and family sometimes are really liberated by us not caring so much and they sometimes stop caring so much about all these silly worldly ambitions. But even if they don't, we've taken the power back to achieve our own peace. Yeah, I mean, look at me, I'm a strange looking person, right? But my family over the years has come to accept this weirdness. Yeah, and, and you know, and now they kind of think it's amusing and cute, and they're like, whatever, she seems happy, you know? And I can see a lot of them changing little details in their life because I've inspired them with my weirdness. They haven't become monks or nuns, but I think they're buying less stuff. <laughs> I think they're drinking less alcohol. <laughs> yeah, I think they're kind of examining the meaning of life a little bit more. Even when I'm having a terrible day full of rotten motivations, just the idea that I'm trying to do this weird thing makes them go, hmm, what is life about? Yeah, it's useful, yeah? So we are inspiring each other all the time. All of us have like a radius of influence. People that really look up to us or find connection and support from us. We don't have to be some amazing teacher or have some amazing status in our workplace or some big name. We all have influence on certain people. And so is that influence a positive one or is it a negative one? We talk all the time about how people are influencing us. Whining and bitching, right? Saying, ah, oh, they're always doing this, ah, oh, they're always doing that. You know, we're always whining about each other. But we don't often stop and think, what is my influence on them? Am I enriching their life or am I making it more challenging? Or both. So, yeah, it's like take the power back, yeah? Yeah. Slowly, slowly, right? So the, the other realms, <clears throat> they're really, re again, reflective of mental states as well as the environment we create with these mental states. And the next one looks really peaceful, right? It's the animal realm, and there's like animals frolicking, and there's nice green fields and ponds. However, the animal realm is full of fear and full of ignorance. Really, what are animals doing all the time? Right, they're hiding. Sometimes they're playing, but they're playing in order to learn how to fight or eat. You know, they're mating, and then they're competing for mates. You know, it's not actually as peaceful a life as a documentary might make it look like. Yeah, there's actually a lot of uh, fear and attachment in the animal realm, but mostly what there is is ignorance. Yeah, there's just a lot of ignorance. Um, they can't study, can they? 
in the animal realm. There's no one sitting down going, hmm, what are the 12 links of dependent arising? Hmm, how can I break these patterns? Right, your cat at home lying in the sun, he's not going, actually, I think I'm really creating a lot of mental habits with this. He's not doing that. Yeah, and it's not like the animals can't evolve or that their mental continuums can't become Buddha just like us. It's just that while they're in the animal realm, that is a very challenging process. It's not somewhere where a lot of work gets done. Yeah. So we don't want to be reborn as a dolphin, okay, everyone? Stop having that aspiration. Oh, I want to be a dolphin in my next life. Stop that now. Yes. Oh, I'd like to be a house cat. That looks so nice. Stop it. Right. How many things have you forgotten in this life? Right? Good, amazing learnings and wisdoms that you've already forgotten just in this life. What if you spent 20 years as a cat? How much would you forget? So much. Would you learn much? No. Yeah, even if you're a very wise whale, having a nice wise whale life, learning how to make cool sonar, still, it's not really that beneficial a life. Okay. So, you know, literally the animal realm is not really ideal, but metaphorically the animal realm, a life that's just driven by animal urges and ignorance, is a real waste of our human potential. Yeah. So, really kind of noticing, where do I just kind of live in this kind of animal, indulgent, ignorant, house cat way? Yeah, because it's, it's not like bad to do that, it's that it's a waste to do that. It's a waste. Okay, and so then we have the hell realms. Yes, Buddhists believe in hell, brace yourself. Um, but really they are symptoms of anger. Yeah, that's the, it's the environment you create through anger. It's not anyone sending them you there. No one is punishing you. You punish your own mind with the habit of hatred. Yeah. So whether you think of this as a metaphor or as a literal place, think of how painful it is in your mind when you're boiling mad. Yeah, when you're just boiling mad. You're not effective in changing the world that has made you so mad, and you are suffering terribly. And then there's the anger that's like ice. Yeah, like frozen anger, like passive-aggressive anger, where you just kind of lock down in disappointment, or you're disillusioned and you just kind of freeze. And it's kind of like you're punishing the people around you by withdrawing your affection. They should know I'm displeased by the fact I'm not talking. They should know I'm unhappy because I'm not smiling. You know, and we kind of get into this weird way of thinking. And occasionally it's effective for opening up conversation, but usually it's just problematic. Yeah. And what it, first thing it does is make us hurt. So there is anger that is like fire, and there is anger that is like ice, which is why there are hell realms that look like fire and hell realms that look like ice. Yeah, because we create that with our own mind by our style of anger. So this is a really useful one to kind of examine in ourselves of the next time you're just full of rage, to ask yourself, why am I hurting myself? with things that I didn't want, yeah? You just didn't want whatever it was. To. Why are you making yourself hurt because of it? You didn't want them to say this, or you didn't want this situation to happen, or you're disappointed in yourself. Okay, then become strategic and try and problem solve. And if you can't problem solve, make some peace with it. But instead, we then add this extra drama to it, which really is self-punishing and ruins our health. And it sounds so simple when we're talking conversationally, right? But when you're in the heat of anger, it feels necessary. Yeah, doesn't it? When you're really angry, it feels like you have to feel this way. Yeah, and if I don't feel this way, somehow, then it will make it seem like I agree with the situation. Yeah, you know this weird logic we have? If I'm not angry, people won't think I care. Or if I'm not angry, that means it doesn't matter. Things can matter. You can want things to change and not be drinking all of this fire and ice. Yeah, and so it takes deep thoughts about this when you're not angry. Because then you'll catch yourself the next time you move into anger.
If you do this process in the middle of your anger, you'll just find more reasons to justify your anger. Yeah, and you'll say, yes, but, yes, but, yes, but, yes, but, and you'll keep yourself nice and angry. So when you're actually angry, you do something physical to move the energy out of your body. Yeah, don't overthink it, because anger is thinking too quickly anyway. Yeah, depending on the type of anger. But you know when your mind starts really spinning, yeah, going over and over and analyzing and analyzing and really agitated in this way. Don't add more analysis to it at that point. Think, okay, I'm going to think about what just happened later when I'm relaxed. Right now, I'm just going to be productive with all of this excess energy. I'm going to go for a jog, I'm going to clean the house, something like this. Yeah. And then when I'm settled, I'll analyze. Okay, so then we have um, the hungry ghost realm, which are these guys with um, big bellies and tiny mouths, and uh, it looks really painful and uncomfortable over there. <clears throat> and the dominant affliction of this realm um, is attachment. Yeah, and it's this kind of attachment like um, an addict has, where even when they get what they want, it's not enough. And almost in the next second of getting what they want, they're planning how to get more. And this mind of an addict, maybe we know addicts, maybe we're recovering addicts, but we all have this kind of pattern in us, in some area or another, where it's just never enough. And so think of this like big, huge belly, and then this tiny little mouth, and you know, and it eats, and then it's just like nothing is in the stomach, and it keeps eating, and it keeps eating, and it's never full. And they say in this realm, even if they do get food, it's like fire going down their throat, and it's not satisfying. Yeah, and really, you know, again, whether it's a metaphor or whether it's literal, think of the hungry ghost in your own mind. Yeah, this one that's just always searching to be filled. Yeah, this one that just cannot allow satisfaction, that cannot allow contentment, that gets what it wants and immediately wants more. It's a really unfortunate habit, and it's encouraged everywhere in society. So we want to kind of celebrate any time we catch ourselves, yeah? Rather than being like, you're so bad, you always do this. Whipping, whipping, don't do that. But really notice, any time you catch yourself, this hungry wanting more, that moment of reflection is really profound, because most people live their whole life half content, striving, hungry. Yeah. Most people live their whole life that way. Yeah. Maybe they finally find the perfect partner, and it's working out really well, and they're achieving excellent intimacy and communication, and it's really as good as samsara gets, and as soon as it starts to become settled, they sabotage it. Do you have friends like this? Have you been this? Yeah, it's really as good as it gets, right? Given two human beings with human afflictions. Yeah, and you know, really it's as good as it gets. And then you're like, hmm, actually, that one old boyfriend, that one old girlfriend, actually they did that a little bit better. I should go back to them. Or, hmm, actually, maybe if I get myself a bit more fit and I kind of change the hairstyle, I can upgrade to a slightly cuter partner. We get into these really superficial ways of thinking because we're not happy. Yeah? So instead of saying, why is this not making me happy? We need to ask, why is this not making me happy? Why is my mind not allowing happiness? Yeah? And you really use your logic and say, actually, I'm doing pretty good. Okay, health. Okay, family communication. Okay, partner. Okay, whatever. Like, it's all workable. And if something isn't workable, okay, snip, snip. But, you know, if it's workable, like, find a way to be happy. Because the main thing is the mind. So, what we're, tr what we're trying to do most of the life is to find some sort of perfection and find some sort of stability that is impossible in samsara. So we're setting ourselves up for failure. We're disempowering ourselves. Yeah? And so recognizing that actually should make you very happy. Because there is this lie out there that somehow you could get it all together. 
and then you think you're the loser that hasn't been able to do that. You're the one exception who hasn't been able to figure out life. When in fact no one has. Because life isn't solvable. This life is too complicated, too impermanent, too full of afflictions to have that kind of perfection. So let go of that plan, it frees up so much time. And make the plan, how do I work on this mind so that it can be happy anywhere, with anyone, in any activity? How powerful a person will you be? And like, how happy are you when you can be really content with less? Because we have tastes of that already in our life, don't we? Where we are surprisingly happy with very little, if our mind was in the right place. And it makes you feel really confident. Yeah, like if you've ever uh, traveled with just one bag, or um, done some sort of work that uh, no one noticed but you knew was worthwhile, and at the end of it you're just really, really satisfied. I did a lot with very little. Yeah, so if you can remind yourself of those little times in your life where you took the power back and realized it lied with you, yeah, then you do it more often. And you escape the hungry ghost realm. And then we have the human realm. And I should say the hungry ghost realm attachment is more like a miserly attachment. Whereas the human realm attachment is more like desire. So the hungry ghost attachment is seeking, striving, but it's also this kind of holding. Yeah? Whereas the human realm is more like going around, trying to get, trying to get. And, you know, the, the human realm is very unique in that there is enough suffering to make you question suffering and enough happiness for you to have space and freedom to explore life. In the God realm, there is so much pleasure that you just forget about the path. Even though there's drama, it's also really pleasant. Yeah, you have, you know, good physical health, you have nice physical conditions, and so the spiritual path is like, eh, some other life. In the animal realm, the hell realm, the hungry ghost realm, too much suffering, you cannot practice. Yeah, the mind is just too clouded with pain. But in the human realm, you have happiness, and you have suffering. So you can really start to develop the spiritual path. We're in a really unique situation with a human life. And, you know, if we think about times in our life when things have been very easy, maybe there's been a year here and there where things have been really smooth, were those your big growing years? Or were those kind of your plateau years? You know, we think, oh, maybe I'll start to practice when things get easier. Yeah, or maybe I'll start to study when space and time opens up. And sometimes that's true. But usually when things get really easy, we become lazy and just indulge. Yeah? Unless we have some drive fueling what we're going to do with that easy time. Yeah? So having some challenges in life actually keeps you a bit more focused on developing your mind. Yeah, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have some challenge. And then if you're lucky enough to not have challenge, you can remember old challenges. <laughs> so this is kind of a really rough summary of the six realms. <clears throat> and the, there's a black half of the um, wheel and a white half of the wheel, basically showing kind of the, the harder elements and the easier elements. So you see an animal, um, a hungry ghost, and a hell realm being in the black side having a lot more suffering. And you have a human being and God and demigods on the white side having a little bit less suffering. But the main part is the center, which is like um, the core or the battery or the charging system for the whole wheel. And this is anger, <coughs> attachment, and ignorance. And so this bird um, is often called a pigeon. Um, sometimes it's called a turkey, but it's actually some bird unique to India and Nepal during the time of the Buddha, which may or may not still exist. And apparently it was a bird that was particularly desirous. Um, if you have ever seen uh, ducks or geese, maybe? 
that was a little traumatic, right? Yeah, it, was a, um, it was a bird like that, yeah, that had really a lot of desire and kind of just like all the time, yeah. So just a really full on kind of a desirous bird. So this represents attachment. And, um, you know, even think of just like chickens in a yard, the way they're always pecking, 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 looking for food, looking for food. It's like their whole life, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and so this is kind of the embodiment of attachment. And then a snake represents anger. One, because snakes themselves are quite volatile creatures. So even if you touch the snake on the tail, it often gets really upset and wants to bite you right away. You know, they don't have a lot of patience with snakes. But also from the perspective of the observer, people seeing a snake often become quite concerned and angry and, oh, get away. So it's because it represents this for us that it's the kind of depiction of anger. And then the pig represents ignorance, which, you know, we think, oh, but pigs are actually quite smart. That's strange. But the reason that pigs are representing ignorance is that they will um, love the people who look after them and feed them, even though those same people will wind up killing them. Yeah, that's that kind of ignorance. Yeah. So, you know, whether or not you kind of agree with the, um, <laughs> the picture choices, this is the core of the problem, anger, attachment, ignorance. And sometimes these animals are shown kind of biting each other's tails in a circle, one leading to the other. And, you know, you can choose which one you work on, or you can work on them all three. But here's kind of, if you can break the core of the wheel, the rest of it will just go a little bit. So um, we'll have a little break, and then we'll do a meditation on this, um, and start to go into these in a bit more detail. That's just kind of a rough idea of the picture itself. Um, are there any pieces of the picture that you wanted to clarify? spoke about animals and cats. She felt uh, like impressed no, by that because she has a kitten, two kittens, but one of them, when she is meditating, jumping gets, on the lap. Jump, yes, but it's, tries to put her <laughs> fingers, and even she thinks that she had, when she took refuge, she, she had this wriggle, mm. and she thinks that the kitten stole it from her <laughs> yeah. because she doesn't find it. And, and so it's, uh, she wanted to share that. <laughs> Cute, but unfortunate. <laughs> but at least they have good imprints living with you. Maybe they learned some good habits watching you. And in the future they will be your students. <laughs> okay, so we'll have a cup of tea and come back at 12. Oh, one more? Yeah. Things that in his case, he's got all the different uh, defilements or disturbing emotions you described, uh, more or less in a balanced way. Mm. But there's always something missing, no? That, well, the last, is, he, he gave the example of a swimmer, mm -hmm. that the, 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 the final mm -hmm. part is difficult to overcome, mm -hmm. no? to, to, to improve his record or yeah. whatever. So uh, somehow he feels that he's. Well, he has pride, but he's not so proud. Uh, but to, to have a higher state of, of, of consciousness mm -hmm. is like a, a small part that's very difficult to mm -hmm. achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we work on emptiness. Sobre la Sobre? Ah. Yeah, we work on uh, wisdom realizing emptiness. La que, que que la and okay. you can refine your project. At all emptiness all the time. Entonces puedes refinar cada vez más tu proyecto y decir va a en todo momento. Y ahí es como, eso es lo que te faltaría. But like uh, imbued with bodhicitta, thinking I do this for others, for others. Y esa vacuidad imbuida o impregnada de bodhicitta, hago esto para los demás. No solamente para mi propio beneficio, sino también para beneficiar a los demás. So, uh, 12? A 12 momentos. Thank you. So, starting at the top with ignorance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so blind, blind man with stick. Ignorance, everything starts from ignorance. We have the eight ignorance. Okay, karmic formations. A guy making pots, because karma is of different weights, of different sizes, of different significance. That's why many different sizes of pots. 
And also, you are the creator of your own karma. And consciousness is a monkey because the mind is like a monkey jumping around. Name and form is a ship with people uh, representing the five aggregates. Form, feeling, recognition, compositional factors, primary consciousness. <coughs> then the six sources is an empty house. And uh, these are the very subtle form that lives within a body that are like the house for eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind consciousnesses to reside within. And due to these six sources, we are able to move on to the next one, which is contact, which is a couple in union, um, showing the meeting of the outside and the inside, which immediately leads to feeling, depicted as an arrow in the eye, because you cannot ignore an arrow in the eye. So you cannot pretend not to be influenced by feeling. So far, so good. Okay. Then, craving is uh, someone drinking alcohol, like uh, the craving someone has when they are attracted to alcohol. And then once they're drunk, we have grasping. So the craving escalates into grasping, which is depicted as a monkey going for fruit. <coughs> and conditioned by that craving and grasping, then we have potential existence, which is depicted by a woman who is pregnant. And that's showing um, something about to come into fruition, the karma being ripened, <clears throat> which then uh, becomes birth or rebirth, depicted as a woman giving birth. But we remember that uh, rebirth in Buddhism is the meeting of sperm, egg, and consciousness, the moment of conception for a human being. And then, as soon as we are born, becomes the first moment of aging, which leads to death, uh, which is depicted by an old person carrying a horse on their back. And so this wheel is a um, minimum of two lives being depicted. And uh, the main opportunities for practice are between um, ignorance and karmic formations and between feeling and craving. These are really good opportunities to break patterns, um, but we can be uh, working on it in many levels. So then we have these um, six sections in the center here. Starting at the top, we have the God Realm. And this is basically the embodiment or the depiction of pride. And then just to the side there, you see people with bow and arrows. And the demigod realm, whose primary affliction is jealousy. And so they share a realm, but have slightly different experiences within that realm. And again, you can think of them literally, or you can think of them metaphorically. But most important is to challenge your own negative states of mind that are like this, to look at our own pride and our own jealousy. And then moving down, oh no, we have the um, animal realm, looking very sweet and peaceful, but actually dominated by ignorance. And not just ignorance, but also fear, attachment, etc. And then moving down, we have uh, the hell realm, and we have cold hells and hot hells, all reflections of a mind that's filled with hatred. So it's quite graphic, um, 
And if you read the Lam Rim Chenmo, there are many, many different kinds of hells, kind of specific to different mental habits and mental situations that we're creating. So um, anyway, it's a bit like Dante. And then now we move into Hungry Ghosts, whose um, dominant disturbing emotion is um, an attachment of the miserly type. So really it's like this um, holding, this tightness, not wanting to let go of what you have. Also addictive and never satisfied. And uh, they're depicted with these huge bellies and small mouths. And then we have the human realm, whose dominant affliction is desirous attachment. But we see, um, you know, the sort of classic activities of human beings, work, and study, and life, and death, and birth. And um, that actually this is the best place for practice, is to be in a human realm. Even if you have desirous attachment, which is unfortunate, there's still many opportunities to practice a path. So then we have the center. <clears throat> And uh, the black side has an uh, animal, a hungry ghost, and a hell realm being, showing the kind of downward spiral, the suffering spiral of the realms. And then we have the human, god, and demigods um, on the white half, showing the realms that have more happiness and contentment in them, but still are within the samsara. So then we have this uh, desirous bird, representing attachment, and uh, the snake representing anger, and the pig representing ignorance. Again, because uh, these types of birds, whether it's a pigeon or some sort of Indian version, <clears throat> is something that is completely obsessed with desire, desire for food, desire for sex, just completely absorbed with greed and needing. Um, snakes being very sort of volatile, touchy creatures, that um, uh, will be easily provoked, and also when we see them, we're easily provoked. And pigs, because despite being very intelligent, um, their intelligence doesn't stop them from trusting the very people who will wind up killing them. And they'll also ignorantly just eat anything. So, this is the core of the problem, is anger, attachment, and ignorance. And this is the core of our work to be able to identify these within ourselves and then uproot them within ourselves. So that's the summary of the picture. Um, and then we're going to do a meditation on the six realms. So do you have questions about the pictures? We'll go more into the concepts, you know, as the course goes on. But the pictures themselves, is there anything you're wondering about? Mm -hmm. Is there any relationship? I see that the realms are divided and... Mm -hmm. They just happen to end up in the... Is there any relationship between the realms and the... Oh, the 12 links? Yeah. No. no. Um, kind of think of them as like um, separate topics within the same big teaching. So the whole thing is like cyclic existence or samsara. Um, the outer wheel is kind of like the moving process that is continuously going on, and then it could take the form of any of those six. So you can have the 12 links within God, 12 links within demigod, etc., etc., like that. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. The, the fiction of the six realms, does it mean that we can be reborn in any of the six realms, literally, or is it, or you are reborn as a human being and the main disturbing emotion is predominant mm -hmm. in your life? <clears throat> Either. <laughs> yeah. Or both. Yeah, um, look, some, some teachers are very literal about this trend, about this depiction and talk about these as real physical places that actually exist on this planet. Um, and in that case, you know, the god and demigod realms are up above, as you would expect. And uh, animals and humans share the earth. And um, hungry ghosts also share the outer plane of the earth, but we don't have the karma to see them. Although sometimes some people do see them. And then uh, hell realm beings live under the earth. 
Um, although there's some people who think that they are the beings that scientists have been able to find within fire and within permafrost. So there's some people who think that too. Um, so that's when you're talking about it in terms of the literal, the literal presentation. Um, a lot of teachers, including our teacher Lama Yeshi, says it's useful for us, especially modern people, to think of them as uh, lived experiences within one human life and metaphors for our own kind of mental experience and what we project around us. The way you could be in a beautiful place, but if you're very angry, it doesn't look beautiful, for example. So really, you know, kind of however it suits your mind, there's a useful way of looking at these. Yeah. I look, from my own perspective, I think it's quite interesting that so many religious traditions and philosophies have similar depictions. That why would that be? unless there isn't some part of us that sort of remembers. Um, you know, also maybe the mind and whatever the subconscious works to create images like this, um, kind of universally throughout cultures, and maybe they don't actually exist literally, it's hard to know. But uh, it is interesting that, you know, you see very similar depictions in, you know, like Dante's Inferno, or like the old stories of the Greek gods and goddesses, um, the way different uh, ghost experiences are talked about, you know, it's interesting that there is so many similarities and parallels across cultures. Um, so there's many reasons why that could be, but it's, it's worth um, experimenting with what if that is the case? And what am I creating for my future? But even if these things are complete fairy tales or just kind of images that we create through our, you know, mental projections, I think it is really useful to ask ourselves, what future am I creating for this mind? Um, you know, for example, a lot of us will have dementia or Alzheimer's if we're lucky enough to get old. Mm. What we'll carry with us is our current mental habits. And we'll have less control over our physical expression of those. So we might be a really kind, sweet, polite person on the surface, but if we're full of anger, then strip away your control, and here you are just angry in a nursing home, having, you know, 20 years of giving nurses a hard time, and your poor family. You know, and then you're also suffering with your terrible anger, and maybe have moments of being clear and lucid and seeing yourself out of control and feel sad, humiliated, ashamed, blah, blah, blah. So what is the legacy you're leaving your own self, even within this life? You know, it's, it's worth the effort to control the mind and to tame it and to find ways to be content and peaceful in a number of different circumstances. Um, we know that, you know, that there's a climate change situation happening that may or may not be reversible. And in any case, it's probably not something that is going to be comfortable for us. Yeah, either our habits are going to need to change significantly, or if we don't change our habits, we're going to experience the damage of that very significantly. How hard was it to be patient yesterday when it was so hot? You know, what if it just keeps getting hotter? So how is our mind going to cope? It's, it's worth the effort to kind of give ourselves a positive legacy for the future by training the mind now. So there's lots of ways to think about it. Yeah. Your choice. Yeah. The core part of the anger and attachment is located. Does it affect the whole will, the whole, all the realms and the whole will? Yes. See. Um, it's just uh, some realms will have a more dominant one than others. Yeah, but all of them operate everywhere. Um, it's said that in um, the form and formless realms, which may or may not be part of the god realms, depending kind of how you're dividing things up, that um, there are some realms within samsara that have less or no anger, less or no attachment, but still have ignorance. <clears throat> but generally speaking, they all have all of them. Yeah, so yeah, it's an interesting thing, and it is interesting that the Buddha said, draw this image based on my description and put it on the door of the temple. You know, it's kind of saying, right from the very beginning, let's look at what is the problem 
why are we coming into this meditation hall, what are we doing here anyway, is to break this. Yeah, and hopefully breaking this, not just for ourselves, but in such a way that we're fully developed and able to help other people do the same. You know, so it's, uh, it's good to have it out and visible and for people to say, what is that? Explain that to me, and for there to be lots of people at the Dharma Center who know this image really well and can say, this is this, and that is that, and here is the problem here at the center, and this is our main work. So if you're coming into this hall to um, find, I guess, relaxation and, uh, you know, just kind of worldly, hedonistic happiness, that's very understandable and will be a nice side effect, but shouldn't be the main point. The main point should be overcoming negative habits, developing positive habits, so that we can be of greatest benefit to all sentient beings, and then we'll be very happy too. You know? um, otherwise, you can just go to some kind of new age yoga studio that's, you know, whatever, for just immediate. So you could go to both if you want. I'm not going to check. But when you're in this room, to know what the purpose is, and when you're in that room, to know what the purpose is. You know, wherever you are, why am I here? What is the biggest motivation I can carry into whatever study I'm doing? I think it's really useful for having a meaningful life. Then you can even use the biggest motivation in a sweet little new age yoga studio and be, you know, getting a strong, healthy body as a vessel to be of benefit to all sentient beings. Then, excellent.